Let's uh, read this two psalms again together, 42, 43, and also you can open it in your own Bible, but for unity of uh, voice, let's uh, read what's on the screen together. You can remain seated, but let's read together. From the very beginning, Psalm 42, 43, for the choir director, a masculine of the sons of Korah, as the deer pants for the water brooks, so my soul pants for you, O God. My soul thirsts for God, for the living God. When shall I come and appear before God? My tears have been my food day and night. While they say to me all day long, where is your God? These things I remember and I pour out my soul within me. For I used to go along with the throng and lead them in procession to the house of God with the voice of joy and thanksgiving, a multitude keeping festival. Why are you in despair, O my soul? And why have you become disturbed within me? Hope in God, for I shall again praise him for the help of his presence. O oh my God, my soul is in despair within me. Therefore, I remember you from the land of the Jordan and the peaks of Hermon from Mount Mizar. Deep calls to deep at the sound, the roar of your waterfalls. All your breakers and your waves have rolled over me. The Lord will command his loving kindness in the daytime and his song will be with me in the night, a prayer to the God of my life. I will say to God, my rock, why have you forgotten me? Why do I go mourning because of the oppression of the enemy? As a shattering of my bones, my adversaries revile me, while they say to me all day long, Where is your God? Why are you in despair, O my soul? And why have you become disturbed within me? Hope in God, for I shall yet praise him the help of my countenance and my God. Vindicate me, O God, and plead my case against an ungodly nation. O deliver me from the deceitful and unjust man, for you are the God of my strength. Why have you rejected me? Why do I go mourning because of the oppression of the enemy? O send out your light and your truth let them lead me, let them bring me to your holy hill and to your dwelling places. Then I will go to the altar of God, to God my exceeding joy. And upon the lyre I shall praise you, O God, my God. Why are you in despair, O my soul? And why are you disturbed within me? Hope in God, for I shall again praise him the help of my countenance and my God. Lord, we invite that your Holy Spirit be our guide and our teacher. We know that it's only as your Spirit gives us understanding that your word can sink deep into our spirits and minds and wills. And we pray that you would lead us into that truth for each one of us individually and for ourselves collectively as this chamber fest group this week. In the name of Jesus, I pray. Amen. Well, you'll remember that yesterday we were talking about yourself as water, your own soul, that nefesh, the whole of you. When we ended rather abruptly in the midst of this Psalm 42, 43, with the accusatory cry of scoffers, where is your God? In verses 3 and 10 of this Psalm. In response to that heart-rending cry of the honest pilgrim, why are you in despair, O oh my soul? Why have you become disquieted within me? Repeated almost verbatim, verses 5, 6, 11, 
and in chapter 43, verse 5. What does the psalm suggest then in terms of an answer to that question, where is your God? I want to propose to you that we cannot, if we care at all for good biblical theology, just leave the question hanging. Some people would offer that we just leave it there and you find out in your own existential experience. But I disagree. I think the Bible does give us solid truth and answers. The preamble to the answer is supplied, I think, in verse 6. If you look at that carefully with me, where it says, O oh God, my God, my soul is in despair within me. Therefore, I remember you from the land of Jordan. From previous encounters with God. Remembering God's goodness and faithfulness is a key aspect of the Hebraic spiritual experience. For example, I cannot tell you how many times the discipline of reviewing my own history, my own personal remembering of what God did in my life through my experience amongst others at the Chehi Summer School of Music when I was 16, 17, 18 years old. And how that has revived my trust in God and given answer to the question, where is your God? I remember how he spoke, how he met me so often in these beautiful uh, communal settings of Chehi. I want to tell you about one of those in particular. Many of you have heard the name of Samuel Shu, Dr. Shu, who was so instrumental in the early years of Chehi, a pianist, Chinese American. He was such an important aspect in my life. He wanted to treat me like a colleague, but I just couldn't get around. He was my guru. He would ask me questions and I'd say, no, 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 it's me to ask you questions. At one point, I met my wife, Cynthia, here at Chehi. That's not for any of you to kind of pursue, but <laughs> happened to me, <coughs> happened to me. But we went through a period of real soul searching, should we actually marry? We were moving toward that, but both Cindy and myself were really struggling with, is this God's purpose, goal. Are we really compatible? We came from quite different spheres of the Christian tradition, but um, we were wrestling with that. And God spoke to me through Sam Shu when he shared a piece of music. It's at the end of his CD, his last CD before he died, the very last number but at this time, many years ago, he played it. He often turned to this piece. It's a piece by Robert Schumann, uh, transcribed by Franz Liszt for the piano. It was really an art song titled Widmung. And it's translated the title either dedication or sometimes devotion. And Sam said to me, he always thought of it in terms of his devotion to Christ. And so he ended his CD with it. And it just grabbed me that God spoke when he played through that. Wes, dedicate yourself to Jesus, but also freely dedicate, devote yourself to this woman named Cindy Mundy, now Cindy White. And we've been married for 32 years. And apart from Sam Shu, I don't think Aiden would be alive today, <laughs> would not exist. So thank God for Dr. Shu's part of <laughs> all of that. <laughs> so I want you to hear this is Dr. Shu playing.
So thank you, Sam, for Cynthia <laughs> in my life. That music was a remembrance like Jordan land for me. To say, Wesley, yes, of course, like Sam, be dedicated, devote yourself first to Jesus, but you can devote yourself to this lady, Cindy White, Cindy Mundy who became the mother of Aden. So remembering is quite important answer to where is God when you struggle? And of course, the preamble to the question moves on to a very, very critical theological perspective in verses 5 and 6, 5 here, and verse 11. And, of course, in chapter 43, verse 5, repeated three times for poetic emphasis as it encourages, of course, the prospect of something so critical, the prospect of hope. Hope in God, for I shall again praise him. And I, for one, am so glad that biblical spirituality does not acquiesce to the mere acceptance of despair. But rather the living God of Judeo-Christian faith always and invariably espouses a theology that moves into the future based on hope. By the way, if you're at all interested, one of the best theological treatises on hope was written by a German theologian named Jürgen Moltmann, titled The Theology of Hope. Entire thick volume on how hope directs the whole of the narrative of the Bible. But the point of the poem underlying this notion of this psalm is that true hope this is so critical, young men and women. True hope is not contradictory to, but rather is often, very often, birthed in the very cauldron of despair of the soul. True hope is not contrary to, but rather birthed so often in the cauldron of soul despair. And you're being told mistruths when hope is somehow separated from pain and angst and longing and cries of laments and hurts. It is not true in the Bible story. But hope is birthed in the midst of them. It is precisely the honesty displayed in squarely dealing with soul despair that leads to real lasting <laughs> hope. And these ideas of remembering and secondly enacting hope birthed in despair are both, as we said, preamble because they lead to the one answer to the question, where is your God? And it is supplied like this. In this psalm, there is one answer to that question. It's supplied by the sons of Korah in this manner. They would say, come meet him. Come, meet God again. Where is he? Meet him in the setting and the place that we call worship. When we gather to worship, it is not just a cognitive exercise. It's not just a duty. It's not just a religious tradition. It is for the purpose of meeting God afresh. And that leads to the one yet final use of this water metaphor in this combination psalm, worship as water. Water that 
cleanses you, water that restores you, water that reminds you of the immensity of who God is. It's power, it's cleansing, it's refreshment. In verse 7, <clears throat> particularly, we come to that in the midst of a very clear poetic allusion to water. The psalm writer resorts to none other than the liturgy of worship as a correlation to this water imagery. Read it with me. In fact, let's read it aloud together, just verse 7. Deep calls to deep at the sound, the roar of your waterfalls. All your breakers and your waves have rolled over me. The rabbinic traditions of both the Mishnah, particularly a commentary, sermons based on Old Testament texts by rabbis, and the Talmud, Babylonian commentaries on Old Testament ideas more generally, both of these rabbinic traditions understood this phrase, deep, calling to deep, as a worship expression that brings together the deepness suggested both in the audio and the physical experience associated with huge demonstrations of the power, the immensity, the wonder of oceans and waterfalls and rivers that speak of God and who he is. The roar of the waterfalls and the sense of being immersed, as the text says, your waves and breakers have rolled or swept over me in worship. It is a worshipful expression invoking submission to and recognition of the power of the creator, the one who made the waterfall and every wave of the sea that grabs your soul. But beyond that, it describes this worship experience with the explicitly very arresting phrase, isn't it? Deep calls to deep. It's the Hebrew word tehom, deepness. By the way, it might bless you on this side of the room to know that the word tahoma, the root of it, is feminine, so that deepness is associated with femininity, which I, in my experience, is true. <laughs> and share some of that depth with these guys to help them understand the ways of God. It's the Hebrew word tahom, which suggests deepness, but specifically in terms of something of extreme importance in the faith pursuits of the Hebrews, mystery. Mystery. The mysterious certainly has an angle to it that could easily be described as deep, not entirely understood. And if worship I want to suggest to us today, if worship is anything, it ought to be, at least in one sense, an encounter with mystery. An encounter, in other words, with God, whose ways are deep, whose ways are so often unfathomable, whose ways you cannot always rationally explain. That is mysterious in the sense of the uncontainable within the bounds of human reason and explanation. And this type of poetic language that the sons of Korah so excel in is suggestive of the depth of the human soul 
the deep calling to the deep, the depth of the human soul that longs to connect with the deep things of God. That in Hebrew idea minimally raises and arouses a curiosity. To ask questions like, who is this? How does he work? Why does he do this? What are his characteristics? How do we know him? How do we name him? The mystery of worship is meant to arouse curiosity. There's a transcendence to worship that says there's something beyond that you long for when you're honest. And good Levitical priestly musicians think of their role as arousing curiosity. I hope you learn great techniques and great phrasing and great musicianship, but go away from this week learning how music can cause people to ask questions, to ask what's beyond, where does this beauty come from? It's mysterious. Many of our churches play down the mysterious to the dearth of our souls. The worshiping soul, men, women, is a curious soul. That is why Jesus said, unless you become like a child, you cannot even understand nor enter the kingdom of God because children are innately curious. They, without being told, ask questions. Why? Who said so? Can I do this? Why can't I do that? Curious. Did you ever think of worship in that way as an expression of curiosity? Coming together, meeting God to find out something new. Who is he? What is his character? Deep calls to deep, says the text. A longing for connection with the unexplainable, with the mysterious, with God. Certainly at the most practical level, biblical poetry like this ought to so inform our worship so as to keep it from ever deteriorating into anything that anyone could ever accuse of being trite or shallow. And I would boldly push, <laughs> suggest, on the basis of biblical poetry like this, that trite or shallow worship is an atrocity of the worst sort. It's unexcusable. Trite or shallow worship ought to be understood as an oxymoron that is wholly unacceptable to pilgrims who are growing like the sons of Korah invite us into pilgrimage procession to the place of worship. Worship is meant to be the deepest of experiences with the deepest part of you connecting with the mysterious God, with the mystery of who God is. Deep calls to deep at the sound of your waterfall. The place of and the experience of worship in this psalm supplies the answer to the question, where is your God? As the context this psalmic poetry suggests in which two key characteristics of God 
become tangible in worship. And the text tells us they are two, light and truth. In chapter 43, verses 3 and 4. Oh, send out your light and your truth. Let them lead me. Let them, light and truth, lead me to your holy hill, to your dwelling place. Send out thy light and thy truth. Let them lead me. Let them bring me to thy holy hill, to thy dwelling places, an idiom of worship. Then I will go to the altar of my God, an idiom of worship, to God, my exceeding joy. In worship, two tangible things happen that answer the question, where is your God? Light comes. Understanding comes. Illumination comes into some level of the mysterious God. And it's combined with that very hugely important aspect, truth. It's not a free-for-all. There is truth and untruth. And in worship, it is brought to you. Light and truth. And it's not surprising then, is it, that God the mysterious God became flesh. Jesus said, I am the light of the world. I am the way, the truth, the life. No man comes to the Father except through me. Worship always reinvests your devotion, your vidmung to Jesus. Where is your God? Come meet him in worship. Send out thy light, thy truth, let them lead me, let them bring me to thy holy hill, to thy dwelling places. Then I will go to the altar of God, to God, my exceeding joy. El El Shim Chath Gili El El unto God Literally, the joy, which is my exceeding experience. El El Shimha Gili. And that's so important in the grammar of the text there, so that in the end, the despair that we experience, that's so real and true to our real lives in this human condition, finds its way to God. In the end, despair is not replaced by joy. Do you see how the text is saying, to God, to God it leads me. Where exceeding joy comes into play. Despair finds its way into the presence of God. And as so often in the Bible, it cannot help but evolve into a musical expression. So the end of the text, where it says, Upon the lyre I shall praise thee, O my God. Verse 4, then I will go to the altar of God, to God my exceeding joy, upon the lyre I shall praise you, O my God, O God, my God. And so on this day three of our Chamber Fest week together, I want to really invite you to be astute, 
to be bold, to be ardent, to be a curious soul, to be a musical soul, to be a worshiping soul. Jesus, thank you so much for the sons of Korda who invite us into the depth of worship where we meet God. Worship that is not perfunctory, that is not trite, that is not self-serving, but worship in which we meet you. I pray you'd raise up these Levitical musical priests to serve that capacity, to play music that asks questions, to play music that arouses curiosity and points to the transcendent being, the creator, to arouse those questions that says, what is meaningful, what is purposeful, where does beauty come from? Why is my soul drawn to this sound? I pray you'd instill that in these Levitical priests and help them serve the church and therefore serve the world and be missionaries that answer the question, where is your God? Thank you so much for Sam Shu. Thank you for Vidmung, dedication. And push us to devotion to Jesus, the light, the truth, the way, the life. In his name we pray.